everyone joining. Uh, we're introducing a new series of printers called Rays 3D. Uh, I wouldn't say a, a new lineup, but they're new to us, which is why we're so excited about them. And we want to uh, kind of share with the world uh, what they do, what the possibilities are, um, the price point, and, and all the functionality to it. Um, so as far as topics and things to be covered here, I'm going to go ahead and progress to our next slide. Beautiful. Um, so a quick thing we'll do, actually I'll go back one slide here, is, is we're going to do a, a general about us. So just quick who Solid Experts is. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about Ray's 3D, who they are. Uh, then we'll talk about an additive overview. So if this is a, a new concept to you, which is 3D printing, we'll just do a brief overview of what this is so it makes a little more sense. Uh, we'll also talk about the material options because when it comes to 3D printing, you know, a lot of people think about all the cool things you can make, but you know, sometimes it, it helps to think about what you're going to make it out of, what kind of plastics. Uh, we'll also talk about the two series of printers that are included in the Ray's 3D lineup, which is the Pro 2 series and the E2 series. Um, they're both very different printers with very unique skills and, and traits that could benefit you in different ways. Uh, we'll talk about the slicer too, the software that's included with these printers and, and how you can take your CAD designs and turn them into 3D prints. Uh, and then we'll finish up with some questions. So uh, if, if there's something I didn't answer along the way or there's some uh, other things that maybe you're looking for, um, we can touch base on that at the end. And uh, maybe we can share some contact information as well in case we want to converse a little bit deeper in that. Um, so real quick, um, we are the solid experts. We have three divisions. We have our headquarters in Montreal. We have our Nashua division, and we also have a division in Quebec. Uh, myself, Katie, and John, we're all located in the Nashua division in the US. Uh, we've been around since 1998, so 23 years. We have thousands of happy customers, and uh, I think the certifications needs to be updated, but our technical yes. team is, <laughs> yeah, our technical team is always growing with certifications. We're always trying to learn more and soak up more. So uh, we have hundreds of certifications shared among our technical team. Um, primarily though, we've always been known as your SolidWorks, DriveWorks, and 3D Experience reseller. Uh, we've been very big in the SolidWorks world, but we also uh, support various lines of 3D printers. And recently we have also added 3D scanners. Um, mm. So we do have things like Mark Forged, uh, Builder 3D, Form Labs, and here we have our Raise 3D. Um, so upon, yeah, we can say we're, yeah. we're experts in everything 3D. How about that? Yeah. I would love it. I, I think we have something that says you're 3D experts. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I mean, like I said, we're picking up more skills. So, I mean, we, we've we always been SolidWorks. That's always been a core, um, you know, bread and butter. But we've always also, uh, you know, picked up 3D printers. And it's really exciting to, to pick up a, a new line of printers because now you get various flavors. You know, now you have mm -hmm. more possibilities and less limitations. So we're just kind of excited to share all this new technology that we have. Um, but definitely something that we've picked up recently and we really want to share with the world is that we are now supporting and selling the Artec 3D scanners. Uh, Artec has been around since 2007. They're not a new company. They are heavily awarded. And if you've ever researched, uh, you know, consumer or industrial handheld scanners, you're bound to come across Artec 3D. They're a well-known brand, well-supported. Uh, a couple different sizes here. We were playing with them earlier this morning. They worked out fairly well. Uh, just to have a little fun with it too, um, I'm just going to escape here. This image on the far right here that shows you the Artec Evo isn't actually an image. If I go down here and I click on it, we'll see that it's not so much an image, but it's actually a 3D scan. That is a three-dimensional <laughs> model, um, which is so cool because it's kind of like scanception. You're using a scanner to scan the scanner. Um, yes. But you know, you can see here, <laughs> I brought into SolidWorks. You can see it's a really nice clean scan. You can kind of see what the item looks like. This one here is called the Artec Eva. It's kind of the bread and butter. Um, but like I said, fantastic scanners, well documented, fair price point, and they are incredibly accurate. So uh, yes. yeah, I mean, we have the CAD, we have the software, we have the printers. It only made sense that we now go somewhere in between, which is scanners. Um, so we'll absolutely have some future webinars based on the Artec 3D. And if, if you have any questions excited. on those, we'll get you in touch with Katie, of course. Um, all right, so we'll go ahead and keep presenting from there. We'll just go back to our Artec 3D. So let's talk about what we're here today, which is Ray's 3D. A little bit of background and history on Ray's 3D. Again, they are not necessarily a new company, but they are new to us. A little background of where they came from or where they are now. Uh, they started as a Kickstarter back in 2015. So they were not, you know, a heavily funded company that was developed by, uh, you know, a, a larger overhead company. This was basically a group of guys that wanted to offer a, a new set of 3D printers. 
Um, and what's really impressive is, is that they wanted to go for a $50,000 goal and they obtained that $50,000 goal in basically less wow. time it takes to, to make dinner. Yeah. I didn't so, know so, that. That's cool. Yeah, it, pretty cool because like you don't really see the origin stories of a lot of companies. So right. 2015, it's been six years, um, but it's just really cool that there's a lot of Kickstarters out in the world. I mean, there's a lot of people trying to take on the world of 3D printing um, and to see something that is so successfully funded in the first hour is a very good sign. And since then they've been, um, you know, growing and prospering. Uh, I have listed here on the far left, uh, a series of awards. This is only just a few of them, but they are heavily awarded as being basically two primary categories, which is either the best large format printers or the best overall printers. So it's one of those things where if you're looking for some big size or you're looking for a jack of all trades, uh, Race 3D has done a wonderful job. Um, in this image right here is actually the first generation N series printers. We're now on the Pro 2 series and the E2 series, but you know, back in 2015, this was the product they had up on the screen and, and they absolutely crushed it in that first hour. Um, and since then, they've just been growing, growing and expanding. Um, they are based in Irvine, California. That is their headquarters. They also have another division in Netherlands and another division in China. So a brief overview on the additive front. So anybody who's attending this webinar, you may be complete experts at additive manufacturing or 3D printing, or this could be an entirely new concept to you. And I always like to include this and use the words additive and subtractive um, because we're all familiar with the concept of 3D printing or at least the name of it, we've seen in the news and, and it's a buzzword, um, but a lot of people don't associate with the additive term, meaning that you're adding material or you're building things up. So what I have here on my right is uh, just two examples, which is that there is additive and subtractive manufacturing. Subtractive is going to be more of your machining operations where you might have a lathe or you might have a CNC and you're subtracting material from that stock, that piece of bar stock. This is, you know, a, a valid technology. We know it's been around for quite some time. There's a lot of industry applications for it, um, but there is a certain element of waste and there is a certain element of time and uh, design constraints versus additive also has its, its uh, pros and cons. But with additive, you are strictly adding material specifically into places that you want. And this has the benefits of basically a very low production cost, very um, little design constraints. Uh, and, and a lot more user creativity in the parts that you want to make. Uh, it's, it's kind of a, a, a much more affordable, easy option for prototyping. Uh, so just keep that in mind. Just going forward, you guys ever hear the additive manufacturing? Additive is, is it's code for 3D printing. It just sounds fancier. It's a nice <laughs> term. Yeah, I like it. It is. Yeah, I actually got my first certification out of manufacturing. And, and when I started going to certification program, I was like, oh, that's what they mean. It's 3D printing. That makes sense now. <laughs> adding material there. So even I had some confusion on that. Um, let's talk about the materials before we get into the printers, what they look like, how they work, and all the goodies to it. Um, oh materials. my god, yeah. I went down yeah. a rabbit hole on this last night. That's why I was like, I hope you're going to talk about this. Okay, go ahead. Absolutely. No, no, no. It's good to know. Like most manufacturers out in the world, um, they're going to have a, a, a solution or an answer to most of their equipment. And it's pretty fair to say that in, in um, the RAISE community, they have their own materials that are used with a 3D printer. In this case, it is actually spools. So it's spools of a plastic material. Um, the reason I mention this is that some people are familiar with maybe resin printers or powder-based right. printers or metal printers. Here, it helps to explain that it comes on a large spool, roughly a one kilogram spool or 2.2 pounds. And so I have a question plastic. about that. I have a question yeah. about that. Really quick. So that one spool, I mean, how many parts can you get out of that? Because that to me doesn't look like a big number. Can you it, kind of? It, it, it's in? a lot. No, it, it's, it? it's, okay. a good point. It, it's a lot of material. And a reason for that is that another benefit of doing out of manufacturing or 3D printing is that when you're creating a part, it doesn't have to be solid. So when you have oh, a solid no. aluminum block or a piece of steel, whatever it is, that's solid. That is solid to the core versus out of manufacturing, we can include things like a honeycomb infill. So a nice structural hollow spot in the middle. And what this does, it allows you to get the fit, form and function in the overall shape while maintaining very limited amount of material. So, I mean, a one kilogram spool, 
<laughs> it's it's hard to place it, but I mean, you have almost two pounds two pounds worth of material or a thousand grams of material. It can get you a long way. You can make a lot of parts or um, perhaps hundreds of small parts. Uh, and and given that a spool, cost wise, I mean, a PLA it's like ABS. Thirty four. Yeah. Thirty five. Yeah, on on the low end, you can get spools of material for twenty dollars. On the high end, it's two hundred dollars. But yeah. even then, though, you think about the amount of material you're getting offered. It's really quite a lot so there's there's a lot there to just one of these spools of material um, so there's no powders no gels no resins no no these are good questions um, but what's interesting about the the rays program is that it's not these are our printers you have to buy our filament I mean you certainly can why not um, but they have something else called a OFP or open filament program and the idea behind this is that rather than just relying on the rays 3d filaments and pre-approved materials they have a large library of other manufacturers and other filaments from other manufacturers that are compatible and will work with this printer. So for an example here, I actually have their idea maker uh, slicer library. And what this does is they, uh, they essentially vent um, uh, uh, different companies that make uh, various filaments. So it could be nylons, ABS, PLA, things like that. Um, and these are all compatible with race. But what Raze does to ensure that there is quality amongst the user, the printer, and the company is that they verify if the settings are correct and work best for the printer. So I know it's a little hard to see on this printer here now, but um, there's like a Philrite Pro PLA Plus or a Polymaker Polypropylene um, or a Polymaker PA6 Nylon. These materials are not Raze proprietary materials. They are made by another manufacturer. But the open filament program is basically these companies approach Raze, uh, um, approach Raze and say, this is our filament. These are the recommended settings, speeds, temperatures, and everything else. Ray says, OK, good. They try it. They verify if it works. And then if it does work, they upload it to this idea maker library. And what that allows for me is that the next time I want to use one of these filaments or materials, I can go to the library and get that pre-existing profile. That's really cool, because I just thought, OK, I, I got to now program it myself. To this new material that I want to use that I found on Amazon. If it's Absolutely. here, I'm going to have to figure well, it out. That's you said a key word there, which is Amazon. And that's uh -oh. something. <laughs> no, it, it's huge because I want to say in a consumer and semi industrial setting, there is a massive quantity of filament. I mean, Amazon has their own yes. filament, they call it Amazon Basics. Um, but point being, though, is, is that uh, I, I would have to look in the, the Idea Maker library here. But if someone along the way says we've been using a lot of Amazon filament on our printers and we're, we've got the, the settings just about right and we're getting really good results, share with the community. This is something that the right rest on. of the community should have. Yeah. So they should have the best results for this. Um, so Amazon can reach out or if enough users can say, hey, Ray's like, guys, can we get on maybe getting a profile for Let's this? this. Um, they'll yeah. do that. So there's Ray's 3D approved and then there's some user libraries that are uploaded as well. Um, but if there's anything I want to get across to the viewers of this webinar is that you are not stuck with that one brand or that overpriced premium material. If you have something that works really well or you have plenty of or you have a lot of experience with that material, use it. Use, use it with the Ray 3D printers. It has an open filament program. Just set your temps, your feeds and speeds, and you know, you'll be good to go. Um, That's very cool. Yeah, I have, I have a little uh, quote here from Diogo, but basically he was uh, basically uh, explaining the uh, kind of standardizing procedure here, which is that they work manufacturers to identify the best settings and they share that with the, uh, the community. Um, I have just a variety of materials I want to show you and then we'll get into the printers, um, depending on the applications. So uh, I have four general use filaments. I'll just talk with you real quick. Um, these are very common materials that are used for manufacturing, and especially 3D printing. Um, first and foremost, we have ABS, which is an extremely well-known thermoplastic. Um, it's known for, uh, you know, plastic molding injection, high shrinkage, um, you know, excellent resistance. Same thing said here. Uh, basically, these 3D printers can handle ABS like a champ. I've been printing parts for the last couple of days with ABS with no issues. They've been working extremely well, given that they have a heated environment. Um, again, the ABS is is got good stiffness, tensile strength, uh, pretty good chemical resistance. Uh, you wouldn't want to use like acetone or something like that on them. Um, and then they do have excellent uh, impact resistance. So they're kind of a magic do-it-all uh, material. Uh, there is some other materials here that we have ASA. ASA isn't, I think, too well known, but it, it really should be. Uh, ASA is Yeah, I had to look that one up. Yeah, <laughs> it's like the 
bigger, tougher brother of ABS. And yeah, you about... resistant and weathering. That's what I wrote down. Exactly. Yep. So when you think about ABS, ABS can spend its time outside, but after a while it tends to fade and it cracks. And I've had a couple of 3D printed parts I put on my deck and stuff like that. And I've come back after a couple of years, looked at it and said, man, eh, they could have held up better. The idea behind ASA is, is that it basically has the same properties of ABS, but it has much better um, outdoor applications. So heavily UV resistant and uh, greater on weather. Um, so I would think uh, maybe some marine applications we could try it for. Um, we oh, definitely yeah. want to see how it does in the rain or humidity. Yeah, but for sure, though, the biggest thing is, is that the sun, the sun and the plastic just does not mix. But ASA does well in the sun. It has great uh, UV resistance. Um, the other two that are really well known, and I say the last two are really well known, especially in, in kind of the hobbyist community, um, is PETG and PLA. Uh, PETG is a semi recyclable uh, uh, thermoplastic. And this is basically a very easy material to print with. It's very forgiving. But again, its properties of is that it's very affordable, good impact resistance, high strength. It's got a little give to it. Um, it's got good chemical resistance. And given the circumstances, if you can find a manufacturer that's willing to, you can recycle it, which is really good. Um, that's nice. Yeah, ABS and PETG are two very common materials. I think a lot of people are prototyping in. Um, and then lastly, which is worth an honorable mention, because I think it gets a good rap and a bit of a bad rap at the same time, which is PLA, right? I mean, we come from the world of Mark Forge and other printers where we're always trying to, you know, benchmark ourselves against PLA. But PLA is a very good promising material, but it has a time and place. Um, PLA is polylactic acid. It is a somewhat biodegradable material. Um, it's corn, a lot of people... right? It's made of corn. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, it's corn, it's beet. There's a lot of different, oh, um, beet, yeah. yeah, there's a lot of different vegetables that go into making it. But at the end of the day, it is a thermoplastic. So it is biodegradable to a certain extent. Like if you leave it in a landfill for 100 years or you drop it in the ocean for 80 years, it'll degrade, which is still better than most things. But I, I use biodegradable in a, in a loose word. But if anything, it's using vegetable-based sources, which is pretty cool considering we're not, you know, retrieving large quantities of oil from the ground for it. Um, but what's great about it though is, is that it prints like butter. It is the go-to material for most people using 3D printers because it's just so easy to work with. It has no warping. It's very strong, very stiff. Um, the only downsides though is this it doesn't do too well in high temperature applications. And it really doesn't do that great going outdoors. So the idea for PLAs is that it's incredibly affordable very easy to work with and it's ideal for indoor applications you're checking your fit your form maybe not so much your function um if done correctly you could probably you know give some special coatings or something like that to make it a uh, you know weatherproof or uv resistant but this is more of your indoor prototyping applications stays on the shelf maybe doing some hand holding things like that um but i always like to mention it because i think a lot of people uh you know see pla as this kind of cheap and weak material but under the right circumstances indoors, it can be incredibly useful. It's it's a, an absolute favorite. Um, so, like I said, good good to, to mention that. Uh, two and, other and materials the color, we have. The yeah. color, uh, they got the, a, a wide range. That was one of the reasons my customer bought because it had so many colors to choose from. Isn't that right? PLA, yeah. PET G, ASA, actually all four of these pretty much come in any color under the sun. You yeah. want any color to gold, to rainbow, holographic, not that you really need those kinds of things, but you can get bright safety, orange, yellow, reds and blues. There's all kinds of wonderful colors. Um, there is also two other categories I'll discuss, which is that there are production end use filaments. So it doesn't just end at the ASE and, and a pet G and things like that. Because we have the open filament program on Raise 3D, we can start working with some production end use filaments things like polypropylene, rubber items like TPU, um, fiber filled uh, uh, filaments like uh, uh, fiber glass filled or shredded carbon fiber. Um, we have PBA specialty materials. So point being is, is that if you have a high heat application or something that requires you know, significant UV resistance or stiffness, uh, you can find the appropriate material and you can probably make it work with the spreader. Um, we have right now actually in, in our next slide here, uh, we have a customer now using a uh, ESD-based uh, PET-G. So they are, are looking for um, uh, using this in, in electronics. Um, we also have other special applications that are used for uh, flame retardant. So they're self-extinguishing. And there's also something called PVA, 
And this is something kind of interesting to think about because PVA is a water soluble filament, which means that you can use it for water soluble applications, or more importantly, you can use it for support mechanisms. So that if you want to have some item at a, a strange angle or some supporting feature, you can print with PVA. Um, the benefits, if anyone's coming from a U-print or a Stratasys-based machine, there is no bath, there is no chamber, there is no heater, there's no timers. Yeah. You just you soak just it. Soak it in water. And, and cool water, yeah. The next morning, you'll come out and you'll look at it and it's, it's, it's kind of, it's like, uh, like a paste. It's like a cornstarch. Um, so it's quite excellent. Um, so now that uh, we've been talking for quite some time, let's get into the printers, right? <laughs> So it's absolutely worth so mentioning pretty. because yeah, they really are. They're gorgeous looking. They they look loosely like those N1 and N2 series they introduced back in 2016, but these are the much more improved versions. There are two versions, and I am making sure to include the price in these because the price is yeah, incredibly crazy. yeah. I mean, everybody in the office, we've been choking and not choking because it's too much. We're choking because it's like that's a lot of value for the price point here. But on the right, we have the Raise Pro 2, and on the left, we have the Raise Pro 2 Plus. The right starting at 4,000, left starting at 6,000. There is uh, extended warranties, there is success plans, there's trainings, there's materials, but already there's a lot offered in this price point. Um, the biggest thing, so if you're looking at differences of these machines and what's included in them, uh, the first thing is build volume. So the smaller one, smaller, is a 12 by 12 by 12. That is massive. So that's one foot by yeah. one foot by <laughs> one foot. That's I'm small. rounding okay. up. Yeah, that's the small. So 11.8 going up, 12 by 12 going length and width. That's the small one. And then the Pro Plus, so this is the one that starts at 6,000. This is a 12 by 12, but you get an extra foot on top of that. And it is over two feet tall, 23.8 inches tall. Um, again, that's why they're heavily awarded as being one of the best overall printers and then one of the best large yes. format printers. Exactly, because with two feet, I mean, uh, I, I've been thinking about some ideas I want to make, like vertical wind turbines and some larger components I want to build as one piece. And yes. I can build it in one piece in that printer because I don't have to make into a bunch of smaller sections and glue them together, find dovetails, fastening features, things like that. The size well, you, huge. you built the tower, the leaning tower of Pisa. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to see if I have an image in there of this. Yes, I, I didn't even max it out too. That's the best part. I used maybe. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, I used about sixty percent of it. Uh, what Katie's referencing is is uh, when we first got the printers, I wanted to print the uh, giant leaning tower of Pisa, and I got about sixty percent of the volume before I ran out of material, and I said, you know what, that's good enough for now. I'll come back and I'll, I'll hit it with the big stuff later on. The other thing too, this is really different than other manufacturers of 3D printers, is that you're not limited to a specific nozzle size. 0.4 millimeters, that is always the default in pretty much any industry that you have. And it's a good balance, it's a good balance of size and speed, but the nice thing here is, is that you can increase and decrease nozzle size. Smaller nozzle size provides you more detail, bigger nozzle sizes provide you with less detail, but also speeds up the print. Mm -hmm. So yeah, something like that leading tower yeah. visa. Yeah. Some of them could take two days and you could bring it down to several hours with a with a, you know a, a bigger nozzle. Um, so that's that's always something worth mentioning is, is that you can switch nozzles, various sizes. Um, and then the two other points worth mentioning is the precision of these. So they are using stepper motors. The steppers are very precise. They have something like less than uh, 0.781 micron positioning. So the steps of the motors are very, very small. And what this does is ensures a precision tolerance. Um, but we can't really offer an exact tolerance because it's all dependent on your material. Right. So depending on the material, you can always look at the specific uh, the specifications on it. Um, but just know that the quality of stepper motors they have in these are high precision. And then lastly, layer heights. Um, we are always so used to using, uh, you know, 100 micron, 200 micron. Those are like the always the go to's that we have. Um, should you really, really need the detail, you can go all the way down to 10 microns. That's a tenth of a human oh. hair. Um, in resolution. I'd be pressed to find an application, I need 10 microns, I'd say 50 microns is doing good, 60 microns is astounding. Um, but for the rest of us, you know, 100, 200, 300 microns, you know, that, that's a good layer height. But um, you find yourself in an application where you really don't want that, you can bump it all the way down to 10 microns, um, which is again- Can I ask a question? Yeah. You said, go back to the, depending on the material that you use for the yeah. precision. Um, obviously, when you open it up in the Idea Maker software, that you can you can play with the precision and 
based on the material Absolutely. Like, tell you? Okay. Absolutely, yes. The idea maker sort of slicer that we have for the software or for the printers um, is fully customizable. There's kind of like your simple beginner, advanced, and expert kind of modes where you can see more and more data and, and mess more with the settings. But there is always ways to dial back and forward the precision and tolerance on these printers. Um, and more of the tolerance I'm talking about is, is um, if you have ABS or PETG, uh, something that maybe shrinks and contracts a lot or cools versus something that doesn't, you know, your tolerances could be slightly off more or less, okay. but it's always, it's material specific, but more importantly, it's, it's once you find what that value is, it's consistency. After that, it's just maintaining those values. Um, so yeah, no, it's, it's absolutely good. We've had very good results so far with our printer and, and, and all of our accuracy to it. This is what blows me away, and there's actually a lot of stuff that blows me away on this printer, so so bear with me because I'm in a constant state of amazement. Um, it has two hot ends on it, dual extrusion hot ends. Um, and I think a lot of users look at these and they say, what does that mean? How does that work? I'll Gosh. show you on the next tab here, <laughs> is the idea that you have two hot ends. These are basically the nozzles that deposit the hot thermoplastic that is used for additive manufacturing or that 3D printing. What you can see there on the screen is there's the black one on the right. That is basically going to take turns, and the one on the left is going to take turns. Um, the idea is almost like if you're, uh, you know, your kids are coloring in a coloring book, they're going to use one marker to color in a section, then they're going to put the cap on that marker, hopefully put it to the side, and grab the next marker, and then they're going to color in the next section. The same thing here with the dual extrusions. We have two hot cool. ends. You can put two different materials, two different colors. You can really put whatever you want in there as long as they're somewhat compatible. Um, and you can use these two materials to to uh, kind of cooperate and, and build the perfect part. Um, That's how you made the poker chips, right? Using exactly. The exactly. I had those in the two extra slides. I'll show you this now. The good news, too, is, is that these hot ends that move up and down, um, they have five, five microns of repeatability. Again, that's now a 20th of a human hair, so it's very accurate. Um, it takes less than a second for the switching. You'll hear it. Um, and then high reliability. So they've tested it over 100,000 times, meaning those things just sat back and forth switching 100,000 times, um, and there's no failures. So again, it's a good system. Um, Katie was mentioning, so poker chips, right? I actually have an image right here. I'll show you right there. You can see a couple of these poker chips, and I'll flash back to the previous screen. This is in the Idea Maker or the Slicer, and uh, just as a fun little sample, I really wanted to start playing with those two different colors, seeing yeah. how well they pair and work with each other. So you can see here as an example that we have a poker chip with the Rays logo on it, and um, the left extruder is white, the right extruder is red. Uh, and all you have to do is basically assign which hot end or extruder is going to be responsible for what color. Um, and then you can apply those specific settings within the slicer and you're off to the races. Um, so in this case, this so one cool. takes about two hours to print, cost me about six, uh, well, not even six grams, an estimated price, I think it's about 40 cents a pop. So these are fun little things that we'll be handing out at trade shows and I think sending people yes. just because they got a little splash of color. I, I know yeah. we have to <laughs> we gotta start printing out as many of these as we can. Um, so we'll show some uh, some other options there. The other thing too on the rays is that uh, from an automation function, it has this beautiful seven inch touchscreen on the front. So there's no like old LCD or LED you know dial knobs or anything like that. It's a pretty snappy seven inch uh, touchscreen on the, uh, the the front monitor. Um, full settings from within, so you can monitor the speed, speeds, temperatures, Z-axis, there's entire file management. Uh, and then if we have time afterwards, I will absolutely show it to you guys, which is that you can wirelessly upload, uh, control, and monitor your prints from your desktop. So I'm actually looking over my cubicle, staring at the printer now. Um, I have 100% control over that printer from here using the slicer. Um, to give you an idea of what that kind of looks like, it basically takes the entire user interface on the printer and puts it on your computer. It's it's like a one for one clone. So it's almost like if your finger was there and you're tapping it, you're just hitting it with your cursor instead. Um, so tons and tons of functionality. The uploading, controlling, and, and monitoring, that's that's code for you can upload and store your files wirelessly. You can control your printer wirelessly. And then you can use the wonderful camera to wirelessly <laughs> check in on your part. Again, this is where I'm blown away because at the price point of being 4,000 and 6,000, yeah. it has HEPA filtration, okay? So that's one thing, by the way. If you've ever worked ABS, you know ABS, it's got a little bit of odor to it. Um, yeah. I, I don't think anybody has smelt it in, in the office yet, but when you open up the doors or the top lid of the printer, you can get a pretty good whiff of ABS. 
But when I don't remove the door or pull off the lid, I haven't smelled any ABS whatsoever, which means that HEPA filtration is absolutely working. Um, the HEPA filtration is always going in the back. You can hear it whirring away. The fan's always filtering. Um, and then again, for the price point, it has a built-in wireless camera. It's got a little That's webcam crazy. on it. So um, we can always uh, show that to you a little bit later. So again, a lot of functionality there. As far as the bill plate, I think a lot of people are, are wondering what it prints on. Uh, it is a large aluminum bed that is held in by magnets. Um, this is fully levable, and you have a BillTac uh, silicone surface. So it's not a disposable bill plate. It's not a um, you know a high-priced bill plate either. It's basically an aluminum bill plate that is held down by magnets, and it has this wonderful material used in the industry called BillTac, uh, which is basically like a, a, a highly textured adhesive kind of platform that really grips onto the part extremely well. Um, it's reusable. Um, you can just kind of wash it off, clean it off as needed. And should it eventually wear, you can easily get replacements. It's uh, quite affordable just to replace the surface of the build plate. Um, so that's definitely something worth mentioning. Um, and then I'm going to get into our, I, I don't even want to call it the little brother. I don't even want to yeah. call it the little brother because he's not the little brother. He's he's a he's the cousin or the the nephew. He's he's a whole different breed. And that yes. is the last series that Ray 3D just announced, I want to say two years ago, which is the E2. And the E2 shares some functionality that the Pro series has, but also some other functionality that's entirely new. So I'll get into the E2. Um, the E2 is actually slightly more affordable than the Pro series and the Pro 2 series plus. Um, going in at 3499 but again, just you wait until you see all the functionality that is offered at that. Um, so for the E2, you can, you can just kind of get a benchmark of size here. So you can see the guy holding the filament on the right. Um, again, that's a two pound spool or a 1000 gram uh, spool there. Um, and like I said, size wise, it's not terribly big. It can fit on kind of a workbench, no problem. Yeah, it um, looks like a microwave. It, it really does. I would not suggest, well, yeah. <laughs> Actually, you you probably could cook some food in it. It is a heated build plate. These are heated enclosures, so you absolutely <laughs> probably could cook something in there. The build volume. So coming in a little bit taller than the Pro 2 series, the smaller one, it does have a 13-inch build height, but it does have a slightly smaller 9.4 by 9.4. So a little smaller in that X and Y, but a little bit bigger in the Z. So again, hmm. very doable for making a variety of parts. Um, it has dual extruders, but I say it's with a twist, and I mean it's a twist. If you have been around any level printers, you might have heard something called IDEX. IDEX is independent extruders. The idea is that you have two extruders, and they're operating, and they're printing the item that you want, but these are independent, meaning that they can split up from each other. One can go left, and one can go right. It's kind of like roller skates. One can go left, one can go right. Um, I'll show you the next page here. The idea behind having independent extruders is that rather than taking turns, like the Pro 2 series, where you have to use one nozzle and then the other nozzle and take turns, this one instead uses duplication or mirror mode. The mirror mode is built on the concept that if you're going to print the left side of something, in theory, the right side geometry is identical, but it's just inverted. It's on the other side. So the mirror mode allows you to print two things at the same time, but inverted copies of each other. So like the insoles of these shoes, there's no point in printing a left and a left and a right and a right. It makes sense to print the two, the left and the right. The other thing is, is that we have duplication mode. If you are you know, doing some service work and you get to print out a large quantity of items, duplication mode does exactly that. You get to print two things at the same time, but ideally it should be the same geometry. You're not going to print a rectangle a circle. It's going to be two things. It's going to be two circles or two rectangles, You know, two things that are identical. Um, so already, slightly smaller printer, a little less than a price point, but it does offer this really cool function here, which is the IDEX or independent extruders. Um, any questions, Katie? I feel like you, you might have something stewing in there now. No, no, I'm just, I'm like, those are the, just those two, but now I'm thinking, wow, you could do a lot with that, so. Yeah, exactly, exactly. There's a lot you can do with it. Um, this also includes a flexible bill plate, so rather than Oh, yeah, so we plate, don't, we don't have the flexible in the other two. We don't, but that yeah. doesn't mean you probably couldn't. I would expect Ray's okay. to fully acknowledge it. this, and there might actually be in, available on their store. It wouldn't surprise me if they did have a flexible bill plate available for the Pro 2 series. Um, yeah. Flexible bill plates are nice. I think they're just a little bit cleaner. They're a little bit more satisfying just to kind of peel it apart and the part comes off. Um, this kind of reduces the amount of scraping you might have to do. Um, it, it's That's what more I was thinking, a, yeah. 
Yeah, it's just, it's kind of convenient. It's very nice. It's very clean. Um, and it just kind of helps with the wear of the, the build plate. Um, it's nice, but I wouldn't say it's a necessity, but it's, it's definitely nice. Um, there's two other things too. And these are just really smart things. Keep in mind, they released this printer about two years ago. Um, it's seriously smart. It has automatic bed leveling built into it. So there is a probe that is built into it. It takes a look at your bed and basically does a nine um, bed level mesh where it walks around and kind of looks at all the high and low points. It notifies the user of the high and low points and you can level as needed, or it can account for that. So if it knows there's a high or a low spot in the bed, it will remember where those high spots and low spots are and it will adjust accordingly, which will make a uh, much better printer. So again, like I said, smaller printer, but it's he's a smart little niece or nephew. He's, he's, it's, there's a lot going on there. Um, so really cool technology. <laughs> and then one other thing too, again, it's like there's more and more functionality. I'm so proud of this company already doing things like this. Um, they have an industry first video assisted calibration. I know this sounds weird and I know it's, it's a little bit of a strange concept at first, but the idea is that if you have two nozzles next to each other, they may not be perfectly accurate in location. They might wander, they might move from time to time, just because of the mechanics of the item. What this little industry you know, calibration that they have here allows for the user to basically print these calibration prints and identify where the nozzles perfectly line up on top of each other. And what that does is it allows you to kind of color in the lines without a margin between those two things. It basically allows for you to say, I want the left nozzle to be on X, Y, and Z of zero, zero, and zero, and I want the right nozzle to also be on zero, zero, zero. So it's it's a it's a little calibration tool, but the reason why I'm mentioning it is that it's video assisted. It's not an operator getting down there and looking at it so much. There's a video yeah. element where they're automating it. That's why they're kind of first on this. Maybe get the person in their head out of the printer a little less and <laughs> the camera's there, just use it, right? Right, um, that's a good point. Yeah, so, so there's lots of more tech on that one. Um, and then to that point, Katie, you had some questions about the idea maker, a slicer. Uh, the other half of, of when it comes to 3D printing is that you have your 3D models, you have your 3D printer. How does that 3D model get to the 3D printer? And that's what we call a slicer. A slicer essentially, um, it, it's a conversion tool that turns your 3D models into G-code that is then used on a 3D printer. It is not difficult to use and it is heavily automated for users that want it. And then if you're you know, a kind of person that likes to get in there and tinker with settings, by all means, we'll let you get in there. There's tons of settings to tinker with. Um, the idea maker or slicer I can show if we have time um, is, is a really good tool actually. It has a lot of functionality in there. You can bring in your parts, you can orient them, you can repair broken files, you can cut things in half, create custom supports. Um, you can wirelessly remote uh, look into your printer so you can make changes, upload files, create settings. It's basically the printer's in the palm of your hands. It's just right here <laughs> on my monitor in front of me. The default settings though, I mean, people should try that first before they start tweaking because- A hundred percent, a hundred percent. You should only start tweaking when you have to, right? That's okay. one of those things too, and I think everybody gets their first printer uh, is, is they want to get in there, they want to start modding things, you know? Just like when you're a 16 year old and you get your first car, you want to make it fast. You want to cover it in flames and put pinstripes and you want the loud <laughs> exhaust. And, you know, looking back, it's like, I should have just left it alone. It would have lasted me a whole lot longer, you know? It's here, it's the idea that you don't want to use those fine tuning settings until you see something that you want to improve. So for an example, you definitely want to use those default settings. Um, for an example here, if I am using ABS, we knew ABS works well with a 100 degree build plate, so 100 degrees Celsius. We know that temperatures work well in the 250 to 260 degrees Celsius range. I know that, you don't. That's what those settings are for. Exactly. Okay. I would never tell Katie, ah, you want to bump it up, uh, maybe plus or minus 10 degrees, you know, get some adhesive. Yeah. No, there's none of that. We would just say, Katie, use the ABS profile. It's raised. We're using the white ABS and just print and you're good to go. But then maybe later on, say you want to reduce the amount of settings or you want to make the print time just a little quicker, or maybe you only have so much material left and you want to squeeze it just into that amount. You can start to mess with those settings. But Template settings are there for it. Um, and to be honest, I've been using this printer for quite some time now and I've barely touched any of the settings. I've been using a, prior, a majority of the pre-existing um, default templates. Uh, yeah, I told you about the rabbit hole I went down last night um, getting ready for this. Uh, this 
there's something you can do with the supports. There was like three different settings for supports. Um, Absolutely. So if the design, I, I really was blown away by the, that. Um, those, you, you know, depending on where, you know, the angles and stuff, you can really play with this, how, how the supports are placed. There's so much there. There's so much. And, and I feel like that the mathematicians and the developers that make this would just eat me alive for breakfast because these things go way over my head, but there's some amazing functionality in there, like yes. the supports, you know, some of the supports, um, in a lot of programs, when you're supporting these files, you're adding, you know, mechanical supports and things like that. Uh, it's either like an all or nothing. It's like you mm -hmm. get supports or you don't. Versus here, you can kind of identify the best angle or what requires supports and what doesn't. You can reduce the supports. Um, for an example, there's uh, uh, some things like um, you can have uh, figurines or, or characters or you can have uh, specialty prints. Like I'm printing out a Raspberry uh, Pi case right now. I don't need supports in all those regions. Only some of it are more specific and troubled regions, and I can place supports specifically in those areas. Um, so it's very customizable, which is really nice because if you want to go with a beginner simple mode, that's fine. But if you find some ways to optimize it, you have the full ability to do that. Um, so like I said, it's amazing software. There's a lot of good we, stuff to it. We just had a question pop up um, as far yeah. as shipping. Shipping is free because um, we're in the United States. So anywhere in the United States, even materials. Um, so I just wanted to answer that while we we had it there. Yeah. No, no, this is absolutely that that's a good question. Yeah, so shipping's free. Um like the site has all of the products listed. Um and I'm trying to think. Like I said, everything comes from California. It's Irvine, California. Yeah. It's come, yeah, yeah. It's 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 wonderful. Um no, that's excellent questions. Yeah, so there's a bunch of really advanced functionality in the slicer. Um there's no reason to blow everyone away with it, but at some point we should absolutely have a follow-up uh, webinar which is like tips and tricks and like advanced settings because there's just some really cool tech in here that you know you really don't need right away but it's 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 incredible there's a lot of functionality to it um other things worth showing is is that we have you know about 15 minutes left in this webinar i'll try to make it quick but why don't we just take a quick look at the slicer and um yes, just yes. see how it works yeah Maybe so i have support yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> so on the screen here, I have just a simple screenshot and I'll get into the physical program in just a second. Um, but this is Idea Maker. This is the slicer that we have here. Um, I have on the right a, uh, an example of half of a power drill housing for like a, a Makita power drill. Um, and this is an example where you might print the item on its back with supports on the bottom face. You could have mechanical supports. You could maybe use the PVA soluble supports. So you could easily, um, you know, soak away and wash away the supports here. Um, you can identify which uh, extruders are going to do what operations, the feeds and speeds, um, a bunch of different things there. So because we have the time, I'm going to go ahead and just grab on my other monitor here. Give me one second. Utilities. Cameras. Fantastic. So what we'll do is I'm going to drag over on the right here. Katie, you can see my new slicer here just fine. I sure can. Beautiful. So what I have up on the screen here is something called a Raspberry Pi case. Um, in the world of electronics, we have things called Raspberry Pis, Arduinos, Beagle Bones, basically very small computers that have a ton of functionality in them. Um, you can actually use a Raspberry Pi with the RAISE 3D printers. I, I know that's some more advanced stuff, but you can actually hook up something called Octoprint, which is an add-in that you can put on a Raspberry Pi and plug it into your RAISE 3D. Um, that's code word for basically strapping a tiny computer to our race printer and making it online anywhere in the world. I'll put it that way. <laughs> it, it, oh, so wow. There's, yeah, there's like some open source kind of developer functionality to it. So anybody in the crowd that maybe has a printer of their own or might use Octoprint or Arduino's Raspberry Pi, it offers that functionality. Um, at some point, I would love to get a Raspberry Pi on our printer. So I, fit it, uh, I thought it would be only fitting if I created my own uh, ABS Raspberry Pi housing. Um, so here I have just a, a, a quick view of, of what this Raspberry Pi housing looks like. We have the top and bottom next to each other. On the far left here, I can do things like identify what needs to be um, used for materials. So currently in the printer, not that I'm using two materials, but I have ABS in my left extruder. I have PLA in my right extruder. I'm currently using ABS for materials, so I have it loaded as my left extruder. I'm using a 100 micron layer height with two shells, 15% infill. I'm going to do, you know, touch platform only, use some brass. There's a couple. These are some default settings here. And what I do is now when I do a start slicing, I'll go ahead and actually close that and do a slice from here. 
it's going to go ahead and slice that file. It's taking the three-dimensional file and it's converting to the geocode that we'd normally use. Um, this is where it blows my mind away. I, I know the time constraint might be a little concerning for some, you know, eight hours, but the idea is that if you get in the office early in the morning, not even early, say you start your day at nine, right? You come in, you want a Raspberry Pi enclosure for the next day. You come in, you kick off the model. It says it's gonna take seven hours and 27 minutes. It's gonna cost us $1.47 in ABS, which is incredibly affordable. Um, we know ABS is again, pretty forgiving. We know it's got a lot of possibilities to it. Um, and that's at 100 micron finish. Like I don't even need 100 microns. I could boost it up to say, let's say we're greedy and I, I wanna do two of these. I wanna set it to a 200 micron setting. I'll go ahead and save and reslice the file. There we go. It's gonna be $1.71, so slightly increase in cost. And it's gonna be five hours and 19 minutes. So I can get that part even quicker. Wow. Um, and then I can look at the previews here. So let's see what it looks like. What is the print going to look like? So we zoom in. And we can see basically the print previews and the layers that are going to be used. So we can see the raft that we have on the bottom. The raft is basically just a little platform that you can use if you'd like to. It helps with adhesion. We can work our way all the way up from the bottom and we can see the layers as it grows. All Did right. you design it, design it to have a raft or does the printer automatically add a raft? Like Your some... call. Your call. Oh. So um, the reason why I'm having a raft here is that ABS is again, a high shrinkage material and that is actually a property. So in mold design, the quality of ABS actually shrinking and curling away is, is desirable. Um, so in front of me, I know it's a little bit hard to see on the camera here, but I have, oh, maybe I'll put in front of the light. I have a topology optimized shelf here. Uh, this one is made of ABS and I chose to use a raft and a brim. And these are basically extra adhesive properties to the design that make okay. sure it doesn't curl up on me. But if I was using PLA or maybe polycarbonate or something like that, um, I really wouldn't need those advanced features and I could just kind of print it straight on the print bed. Um, but to your point though, it's me as the user. I get to say, do I want a skirt? Do I want a brim, a raft? You know, what am I feeling for? Um, now, once I slice this file, I can always upload it to a physical 3D printer, right? So I can upload to a 3D printer. We normally were putting it on a thumb drive and walking over to the printer manually but I'm not interested in getting my steps in and instead I want to make sure that I can do it <laughs> online. <laughs> so instead what I can do is I can actually upload this. I can look at the preview of my print. We'll just make sure everything looks good on this. And what I'll do is I can upload it to my printer. I actually have an old file name in here so we won't worry so much about that. I can do a, a raspi4. I can go ahead and do an upload here. And I'm gonna pretend that this is a cooking show where I have the version I'm about to upload and I show you the completed version. Um, I did upload the Raspberry uh, fi uh, 4 to my printer. And what I can do is I can actually go and connect to our printer. I have it connected over our, uh, our network right now. And if I go to connect and I drag it all the way over on the left here, you're going to see that this looks just like our printer. This is the user interface that you see under printer yeah. and it's on my monitor. It's it's a one for one clone of what the printer UI looks like. So I can go over and I can tune the printings. I can look at the utilities. More importantly, I kind of cheated. So here's the Raspberry Pi 4G code file that we just created. It's on the printer, but I did cheat. I actually kicked off one earlier in the day. So let's head on over to the camera. And there it is. I don't know how well you guys can see that, but there is a live feed from the camera. If I went over and started waving in the camera, you see my face there. I won't. I won't do that. That's now. really cool. Um, but that is a live feed of our printer working on that Raspberry Pi uh, case. You can see the rafted thing put down. It's working on that base floor. Um, and then there's a bunch of other functionality in there. We have names. We can tune it. We can store files. We have utilities, so we can modify homing locations, which nozzles are being used. Right now, I can see the left nozzle is at 250. The right nozzle is at 73. The heat bed's at 100, and if I need to, I can always bump and increase and decrease these as needed. Not that I really so have to, all, but yeah. It's on your computer. Okay, yep. so I'm even thinking like my phone. Can I pull stuff, you know, if it's wireless? Uh, are you, it, it's phone? pushing it, but what you could do though is, is that the idea here is that it's basically a desktop application, and I don't okay. think they have support for it now, but that doesn't mean that you can't find a way uh, there are crafty people there, out there there's who actually a, a raised cloud yeah add-on yeah and yes that has a uh phone os interface oh, this is why we have john in the q a fantastic <laughs> so yes you do need to set it up 
like in advance, but yeah, you can monitor with your phone, you can um, see the print status and so forth. That's so fantastic. Want to get on that? Okay. Yeah. No, I, I love it. Like, um, I, I mean, I think a lot of us who use printers, we're a bit of a control freaks. You know, I love to have a little webcam and always see what's going on, see how my prints are doing, see how close it is. You know, I always like to have a tab open. I always like to hover on that stuff. So it's really helpful to see it there. Um, other things too, just to show some advanced functionality here, uh, not that we would necessarily maybe want to do something like this, but say I wanted this to be a two color, uh, a two color, um, Raspberry Pi case, I want the top to be black and the bottom to be white or something like that. If I have two filaments in there, I can very easily just right click and I can say that I want to use one that is using the other extruder or I could always go back, right click it, left extruder, and I could use things like I could use a scale, I could do a free cut, create custom supports, I could do a max fit. Um, the idea here, which is really cool because we don't see this functionality in other slicers, is that say I'm really feeling um, a striped pattern. I really want a striped pattern in my design. I can use something like a free cut tool. And then from here, what I can do is I can position it. So let's say we'll click the model. It gives me a plane and then I can cut the part in half, say right about there. And if I click cutting, what that does, which is just unbelievable to me, is it creates one body and two bodies. I know it sounds like a weird thing because in my world of slicers and things like that, I would have to export this file, go back to my other CAD program, slice it into, export as two STL files, go back in here and redo it. This blows my mind that within here, I can say that I want to cut it in half, right click, give it a different color, and now I can have white, red, white. You know, I could add some striping or I could That's add extra cool. colors. There's so much functionality. We, we are still unlocking all the fun settings in there. Um, and then anybody in the crowd that's, that's kind of watching, they say, well, where's all the tools? Where's all the advanced stuff? You click the settings menu, boom. If you really want to get into it, you really want to start modifying feeds and speeds, fans, layer heights, thicknesses, infills, overlaps, all those things that you just maybe need for a specific application, you can very easily come in here and make modifications on the fly. Um, so like I said, excellent software, excellent printers, it includes the printers, it includes the slicers, and it includes the materials, right? So you get your Ray 3D materials. And then we also know because of the open filament program, I can go on Amazon, buy some specialty filament, and I can make it work with these printers, which is fantastic. Um, so I'll make sure to just connect there again. We'll put up there, utilities, settings, and camera. So we can see that printing away. Um, they're not, so they're we, not terribly heavy. I, there was another question that popped up on my end about can you move around? They're, I mean, like 100 pounds, uh, like two people maybe. Could... That's an excellent question. And I'm actually just going to go switching through a couple tabs here because that, uh, that's a good question. You know, what are the sizes and how do they move? I'm going to go ahead and just present this tab right here. On the left, you can see there's a set of wheels. So mm -hmm. um, the Raze 3D on the right, Katie, you saw the Raze 3D Pro the standard Pro 2, did that the have Pro wheels on the bottom? It did not, did it no. have wheels? Okay, so but they have a, that But one, they have the cart, so. Yeah. yeah, so the cart has wheels on it. It has little casters. Yeah. Um, but the small one, I would imagine, is only probably 40 or 50 pounds, maybe even 60 pounds. The one yeah. on the left, ooh, that one's probably about 85 pounds, maybe a little bit more. I tried to pick it up on my own. I wasn't doing too good. But the point <laughs> being though, is that the bigger one has wheels on it. Um, the stand <laughs> below it has wheels on it. And on the right, we have the smaller printer that you could probably pick up by yourself or two adults. Um, and that one also has wheels on the bottom of it. So they are not monstrous. They're, keep in mind, the build plate is about 12 inches deep. And I'd say they're probably overall maybe 18, 20 inches deep or something like that. So you don't really need that big of a table. Um, and then worth mentioning too, I, I don't know if this was in the, in the questions, these are heated environments to work with ABS, polycarbonate, things like that. I know it's a little hard to see in a picture, but there is a lid on the top that is removable. So you leave it on when you're doing the high temp stuff, you take it off when you're doing the lower temp things like PLA, but these are fully heated enclosures as well, which is really good to know. Um, yeah, they give you little gloves to you know, like taking it out of the oven. If you... Yeah, exactly. The gloves are actually really useful. I like them, absolutely. Yeah, what else do we have for any questions? Uh... See if there's any more. 
Yeah. Well, I'm not seeing any. Yeah, this any questions about material sizes? I mean, any any questions or, or some thoughts that you guys are trying to make and, and you want to know if this is the right application? I mean, again, best overall printer, best large format printer. This is, it's a serious game for the price point. Yeah, I mean, if I can just, if people are still listening, um, you know, let's say you are designing a part and you have a question about, you know, will this be a good application for 3D printing? We do that too. We can, you know, take a look at your part, possibly make little tips for redesigning it, right? We sometimes have people because they want it to be machined, and you know, 3D printing it is a completely different application. So my my brain is is rewired. I would never thrive in a machine job because I've kind of grown <laughs> on the additive concept. You know, like yes. if I want a machine job, I'd be designing things that could never be made, and they'd be laughing at me. Um, but yeah, no, we, we absolutely, when you start to move over to additive manufacturing, um, not that you can't make the things that are being machined, but there's always a way to optimize it, a way to make it faster, lighter, stronger. And we're always glad to kind of help out with that design for additive manufacturing or DFAM. Um, so yeah, we always offer that as a service and we'll always give you a little bit of tips and tricks if, if it helps both of us, you know? Cool. Absolutely. Good, good, good. Okay. Well, uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and, um, uh, I'm going to go ahead and go all the way down to our back here. And I'm just going to make sure I have our contact information because I want that to be something that you guys have. Monica was asking, is printing service an option? Uh, I believe we're introducing service bureau work and a print service as yes, an option. Um, we will just have to make sure we have the materials in stock. But yeah, we we always want to kind of touch base on on what you need printed, what the size constraints are, what the materials you need are. We can always pinpoint what uh, you know things might help make the part a little bit faster, but yeah, it's, uh, if I understand cor uh, correctly, Katie, we're, we're officially offering that as a service, correct? We are official. Yep. Fantastic. Which is really sweet because sometimes you think, can, will we even use a 3D printer? Do we even have the, you know, the bandwidth for it? And, uh, you know, we'll take you through that as far as, you know, we can, we're doing that with one of these guys, uh, customers. Um, they just wanted 10 parts made and they called us, well, we need 20 more. And they've pretty much bought a printer already. So. <laughs> They really, not that we don't love their business, but we love their, yeah. I, I, I am a big fan of a, rather than giving a man a fish, I'd rather teach him to fish. You know, I, I, I always like to get people uh, empowered on their own and we should get them on their own printer pretty soon. We definitely <laughs> need to, yeah. Yes, yeah. good, good, good. All right, well, I, I hope everybody uh, learned a lot about the Race 3D printers. Um, again, they've been around for about five or six years now. They've been doing extremely well, heavily awarded, a lot of functionality for the price point. I think it's a serious contender to a lot of printers out there. Um, and overall, we're very excited to be offering these, and and I look forward to getting these out to uh, to our users. This is awesome. I learned so much, Greg. Thank you. Good, 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 Thank good. Thank you, John, okay. for being there to help with the questions. Thank you, John. We'll get that raised cloud yeah. going pretty soon. Yes. All right. All right, guys. Thank Great you so much. Day. Go stay cool. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you. Bye. Bye.